By the turn of this past century, one out of two Americans was overweight and a quarter of the population was classified as obese. Our next guest says this is all part of a battle fought and won by the food industry. Joining us now for more, here's Michael Moss, New York Times reporter and author of Salt, Sugar and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. And welcome back for day two, Michael. It's good Thank to have you, you here. Thank you. I want to take you back, 1999, Minneapolis, Minnesota, to a secret meeting that took place among some of the giants in the food industry. Put us in the room. What happened? So it was at the old Pillsbury headquarters in Minneapolis, Minnesota. These were the heads of some of the largest companies in North America. I should say they rarely get together. Normally these, these executives are fighting each other for turf in the grocery store and trying to come up with better and outselling products to one another. But they were brought together for this one dinner meeting to consider one issue that was starting to be a problem. And that issue was obesity. They sat down and up in front on a low stage in front of them, got a gentleman named, uh, stood a gentleman named Michael Mudd. And what's really stunning about this is Michael Mudd was not a consumer health advocate from a not-for-profit group. He was one of their own. He was a senior executive at Kraft. And he and a number of other insiders had organized this meeting because they had become increasingly concerned about the food, their own industry's responsibility for, culpability for this emerging obesity crisis. And he gets up and walks through the most stunning and alarming statistics you can imagine. He talks about obesity, he talks about diabetes, he talks about high blood pressure. He even linked bad diets to several cancers. And he touched the third rail of the processed food industry and compared their situation to that of the tobacco industry. And he laid responsibility, at least in part, for these public ills at the feet of the executives of the food companies. And how did they react? And he also, at the end, pleaded for them to collectively start doing something to turn the corner on this do the right thing by consumer health. From Mr. Mudd's perspective, the meeting was a total disaster. They reacted defensively. And especially the head of General Mills stood up and made the following points. You know, we are already responsible to both consumers and shareholders and acting responsibly. We offer everything to everybody. If you want low fat, we have a low fat version of our products. Low sugar, we've got it. Low salt, yes. We're adding whole grains to our products. We're offering something to everybody. If they want it, we can serve. But the notion that we should down formulate and mess around, which one observer sort of called the company jewels, the salt, sugar, and fat, because of some white coat scientist notion that obesity is becoming a problem, no way we're going to go down that road. That was 1999. And how far down that road have they, in fact, gone since then? They came out of that meeting and went back to what they were doing. In many cases, adding more salt, sugar, and fat to their products um, and continuing to do so. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was one of those classic kind of moments in time where the industry sort of fork in the road and do we go this way, do we now go that way? I mean, since then, you know, several million kids who have been born who are clinically obese, the obesity rates have risen. Diabetes is now 24 million Americans now have type 2 diabetes, which is the type that's tied in some cases to diet. Gout is on the increase. You know, remember the arthritic disease used to be called the rich man's disease for overeating, overindulging, and the surge is being attributed to bad diets. Total health cost up to $300 billion in added medical costs and lost productivity for obesity alone. So things have only gotten worse since that 1999 meeting. I want to just one last follow up on that. They didn't invite the press to this meeting no. in 1999. So how'd you find out about 
It was oh. secret. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the beautiful things in terms of researching this book was I came across a trove of documents, internal records. These are the strategy papers, the internal memos, the meeting pitches by the food industry. These are the records that companies create and never think that they're going to go public. And astonishingly enough, I found these in public archives created uh, when the states sued the tobacco industry. And how is that relevant to food? The largest tobacco company of all, Philip Morris, became the largest food manufacturer in North America when it acquired the old General Foods giant and then Kraft. And through the 80s and 90s, Philip Morris was sort of doing what you would expect. They would bring in their food managers monthly to product meetings and listen to their pitches and help them out and coax and encourage them to do things that would sell their products more. They even lent them some of their marketing strategies and tools to help them out. Mm -hmm. And the story gets really fascinating and surprising in the late 90s when Philip Morris has a change of heart. It's come under huge regulatory pressure on nicotine it becomes the first company to embrace government, first tobacco company to embrace government regulation as a way of saving the company. It's convinced that it's on the verge of losing the public trust. Mm -hmm. And when it does this, and the person who walks me through this history is a former CEO of Philip Morris. When they do this, they turn to their food division and goes, how can we be changing our policy and attitude toward nicotine and cigarettes and government regulation and not do anything about food? And they started warning the food division managers that you guys are going to be facing as great, if not greater problems with salt, sugar, fat, and obesity as we are now with nicotine. And they began doing the opposite. They began coaxing the food division to rethink their incredible dependence on salt, sugar, fat. How successfully? Well, turns out Kraft actually did a remarkable thing. Mr. Mudd, after failing to enlist the rest of the industry, managed to convince the head of Kraft, the top officials at Kraft, to go it alone. They created an anti-obesity initiative at Kraft that did three amazing things. First, they cut back on their marketing of the most sweetest products to kids, the TV advertising, on, on Saturday morning cartoons, because they knew, like we know, that kids can't distinguish between advertising and reality. They're totally gullible in that point. Second thing is that they looked at the labels and decided they were being deceptive, or certainly not completely honest with people, especially in their products, bags that are made with two or three servings of snack foods, because their research showed that so many of us will eat the whole thing, and yet, when you turn to the fine print nutrition box, it'll only give you the amounts of what you're eating per serving, not the whole bag. You have to do the math yourself. Kraft said, that's crazy. We'll do the math for them so we're not underestimating how many calories and grams of fat and sugar people are eating. It's a remarkable thing. And then finally, the most astonishing thing is that they put a cap on the amount of salt, sugar, fat, calories that their food engineers could use in creating new foods. They wanted to make sure they weren't doing anything, however subliminally, to encourage overconsumption. I want to come back to the advertising in a second because we've got an ad we want to show. Mm. But just before we get there, do you believe, having written almost 400 pages on this now, that America, maybe Canada by extension, is suffering from an obesity epidemic? I mean, it's not what I believe, it's, it's the fact that industry insiders believe it. Back in 1999, not only did they believe that obesity was bad and getting worse and using the term epidemic, but they were convinced that their own industry was accountable. And I think when you look at the numbers, one in three adults clinically obese, one in five children clinically obese, and then all of the associated ills, especially diabetes, high blood pressure, I, I don't hear anybody sort of arguing otherwise, including the food companies. Hmm. Okay, let's uh, just take a look at one of the monitors here in the studio, because yes. we do want to show one of these ads. This is for Kool-Aid Cool... Well, no, hang on. This is for Capri Sun. Mm -hmm. I'll get the Kool-Aid story in a second. Now, that's obviously aimed at kids, quite clearly. Sure. What's in that? Sugar. Purely. 
just yeah. pure sugar and yeah, and and sort of water. And, 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 and water and, um, and, and and some fruit juice, as I recall. Your but as you look at that ad, what jumps out at you? Kids, cartoon characters, fun, um, uh, pleasure. It's it's pitched at kids, and it's pitching the sweetness of the product. So if you're a parent yeah. shopping with your kid, yeah. and they see that, yeah, on that's the one of the issues. Yeah, no, totally. The, the industry using cartoon characters to sell products is is sort of a big part of the of the um, of the industry marketing strategy. Yeah, they want to go directly at kids. And now let's go back 20 years. Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid bursts. I mean, yes. that's a classic story in this, yeah. isn't it? Again, I mean, the industry sort of glommed onto fruit for its chimera of health. And it's one of the burning issues in nutrition now. School nurses, nutritionists will tell you that even fruit juice is just as loaded with sugar as soda. And if you're looking to tamp down on weight, to control your weight, you've got to watch out for fruit juice as much as you will Coca-Cola, for example. And with the bursts, Kool-Aid decided that it could add just a smidgen of fruit juice, I recall it was something like 5%, and that would enable them to splash the word fruit on the front of the package and give it sort of this, as I say, shimmera of health. And now you see products all over the grocery store touting fruit on the front, and when you turn to the back, often sugar is the first ingredient, and then there'll be something called fruit concentrate or fruit puree, which from a nutritionist standpoint is about as far as from fresh whole fruit as you can go. Hmm. Well, I, I don't want to make consumers sound like they are completely helpless in this, but on the other hand, given all the advertising, given the I don't know, would you say apparent lack of choice at eye level in supermarkets mm. um, of healthier foods? Mm. What's a consumer to do? You've got to be really careful. I mean, some people, many people suggest, look, you've really got to make a list before you go to the grocery store and stick to it. It's an old axiom, but it's so true. So much of the marketing effort in the store and the design and the layout is aimed at getting you to make spontaneous decisions, which leads to sort of mindless eating, if you will, and snack foods especially, and will attract you to those most alluring products. Spend more time in the outer aisles with the fresh fruits and vegetables. Everybody says we should be eating more of those, and that's where you should spend more time. When you get to the center of the store, beware of the middle part of the aisle at eye level. The companies have done studies where they've put devices on people's heads that measure your eye movements, and you hit the aisle, and we all look directly at eye level in the middle of the aisle, and that's where they put the most loaded products. So you're in the cereal aisle, raw oatmeal is gonna be down at ground level or in the early stages of the aisle, and the most sugary items are gonna be either at your eye level or the kids' eye level, mm -hmm. probably both. And so that's another trick to use, which is you know look high, look low. There are alternatives if you spend just a little time hunting. But you, you've got young kids, right? You've got yeah, a couple of young kids? Yep. Don't you find that their desire to get the kind of food that is the unhealthiest possible option for them mm -hmm. is absolutely relentless, and that you as a parent, you know, you've only got so much strength after a day of work, right, <laughs> to be able to say, no, 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 we're getting the healthy stuff, right? <clears throat> yep. You have to yield at some point. Yeah, yeah, and part of that problem is the demise of home economics. I mean, girls and boys used to be taught how to shop and nutrition in this country, and that fell by the wayside just about the start of the obesity crisis, 1980. In our house, we've tried to engage our kids in a little bit of nutrition, not to be dogmatic. We're not anti-sugar or anti-salt or fat or anti-processed foods. My wife set a limit of five grams of sugar per cereal. And so now when we take our kids into the cereal aisle, they're engaged, they're hunting for those cereals that have five grams or less, and they can find them. And I find that when you involve them, they're smart. They don't want to be overweight or sick in other way, but on the other hand, you just can't throw sliced carrots and apples at them, expect to eat them in the lunchroom with all their pals without engaging them a little bit. I'll tell you a funny story about Capri Sun. My eight-year-old came home the other day and said, Michael, I mean, Dad, all my friends are having a Capri Sun every day. And I said, well, okay, but look at the amount of sugar in it. And, you know, kudos to Kraft, they've dropped the amount of sugar, you know, substantially lately, but still, he says, no, I don't want it every day, just every now and then, like tomorrow. 
And, <laughs> you know, I find that we can sort of negotiate with them that way. Treat these processed foods, the most highly sugary fat ones, as a treat, not as an everyday, every hour thing. And then you can make them work for you, not you working for them. Mm -hmm. What did you think of New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg's efforts to cut yeah. down on this by saying you can only sell such and such a size? Yeah. Cup of soda yeah. in the theater and otherwise forget it. Yeah, I mean, I'm really empathetic because, I mean, you look at so many attempts at government regulation, they're all imperfect, whether it's a soda tax or his decision to try to restrict the sale of these mega sodas. And I think the New York Times even editorialized against him calling it a nanny state move. But I have to say I'm empathetic because when you look at how much money the soda companies are putting into marketing soda, often to the most vulnerable people. They call their best, company, their best customers heavy users. And those are people who drink as many as three, so, three cans of soda a day, 1,000 a year. Um, that is not a level playing field. And I'm sympathetic with people like Mayor Bloom for, Bloomberg, who is trying to level the playing field for consumers. And he was completely ridiculed by so many people for doing so. For Ridiculed, his but you know, he got the law passed uh, by his health department. And when polling came out, I think he actually won a slight majority of people. I think people are really starting to get it, despite the lobbying and the advertising by the soda industry. So is that a sign of the times? More of that to come? I think we're probably going to see more of that. I happen to know that the White House is thinking about other things to level the playing field. They're looking at ways to move the subsidies, federal subsidies of highly processed foods over to the fruits and vegetables. So well-meaning parents can go in there and buy those things, which everybody says we should eat more of and not go broke. Um, that's one thing. Restarting the home economics program is another thing that they're looking at. So I think we're going to see some smart government intervention come in to help consumers. I was interested to read, though, that you don't necessarily think a tax on junk food would be smart government intervention. Is that right? It's really hard to kind of go that route. I mean, if, if you wanted to tax something, I mean, why not tax salt, sugar, and fat so they're not so tempting to the industry to use? But I mean, I think probably the smarter way to go is this redirection of subsidies. So instead of, instead of making processed foods more expensive, why not make healthier whole foods less expensive and level the playing field that way? But it's all imperfect. It's all going to have some pushback from, certainly from the industry, if not individuals. So nothing's going to be, nothing's going, there is no silver bullet to, 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 to fix this problem. A couple of years ago, your United States Department of Agriculture Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion published a report. Yes. What did it say? Um, well, you'll have to correct me on which report, because they put out a few. There was, um, remind me. Sugar to fat? This is where are Americans getting their saturated fat from? Oh, yes. So every five years, the USDA brings in a panel of experts, which advises us on how to eat better and what to watch out for. And they determined that the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet now, cheese. That's so odd. Our cheese consumption has tripled <laughs> since the 1970s to as much as 33 pounds per person per year on average. And I asked myself, how did that happen? I don't eat that much cheese, or do I? And it turns out that story is actually really remarkable. Starting in the 60s, people began drinking less whole milk as a way of avoiding saturated fat in the calories. They turned to skim milk. That left the dairy industry with a glut of whole milk and something called milk fat, which they extract from the whole milk to make the skim milk. They started turning that into butter, ice cream, and then cheese. And they started making so much cheese that it piled up. The federal government, being sympathetic, bought the surplus cheese. It piled up, grew moldy, Ronald Reagan came in the office and said, this is really dumb. We're not buying any more of your surplus cheese that people can't eat. But they didn't want to abandon the dairy industry, so they created a marketing scheme by which the dairy industry is allowed to tax itself, raise tens of millions of dollars every year, overseen by the Department of Agriculture, in which they market cheese with the sole aim of getting us to eat more cheese. And a really interesting thing happened in conjunction with the processed food companies. They turned cheese from a mere delicacy that you would eat as an hors d'oeuvre before uh, 
dinner to an additive, um, both in terms of home cooking. Go to the dairy aisle now and you'll see cheese. It used to be sold in block and sliced. Now you see the dairy aisle stuffed with bags and boxes of cheese that's shredded, cubed, diced, stringed, tubbed to make it all the more easier to use as an ingredient in home cooking. And then walk through the grocery store and you're starting to see cheese in so many products. Frozen pizza used to have a little cheese on top. Now you have a lot of cheese on top and more cheese stuffed into the crust. Peanut butter cheese crackers are now in the grocery store and on and on and on. And that's contributed to this amazing increase of cheese and saturated fat in our diet, which we're all now getting way too much of. And what is the USDA's response to all of this? They have dual missions, and that's one of the problems at the USDA that they're wrestling with. One of their missions is to support the agriculture and food industry. The other mission is to encourage consumers and protect consumers and encourage them to eat better. Unfortunately, most from the consumer perspective, most of the money they spend by far is on the agriculture industry side. Peanuts are spent encouraging people to eat better. Hmm. How, you talked about Ronald Reagan a second ago and ending the subsidies for milk. That I get. Mm -hmm. How did this end up boosting the consumption of beef at the same time, which I think did happen as well? Yeah, they had the same program for the, in fact, what happened is the, the beef growers came along and saw this, they called it the checkoff program, marketing program for cheese, and raised their hands and said, hey, what about us? People are eating less beef. They're worried about saturated fat and salt in beef. And the government created a marketing scheme for the beef industry as well, which by all measures has, has worked fantastically. And while they haven't managed to increase our consumption of beef, they did manage to sort of slow the decline, in part by turning beef also into an ingredient. And they started coming up with imaginative ways of using beef in home cooking and in already prepared foods in the grocery store in ways that they never did before. Okay, Michael, in our last few minutes here, let's see if we can spend some time on the responsibility to curb the obesity that is happening in your country and mine. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where the preponderance, you believe, of responsibility lies, and I'm gonna use a cutesy little line here. In the hands of the food giants, the mouths of the consumers, or the regulatory arm of government? Mm, boy, I would like to sort of marshal that out, you know, one third, one third, one third. Is but it even? It's, gonna, it's a case by case sort of situation with every person and every family, what's gonna, what's gonna happen. I mean, hats off to Michelle Obama for encouraging more exercise by kids, and certainly the food companies like to talk about that. If only we moved more, then we would expend more calories and that could help solve the problem. There's some truth to that. I think the food companies are hugely responsible. This is, these are their products. And while any one of them may not make us obese collectively, there's no question that they do. Our own responsibility lies in this phenomenon. Starting in the 80s, it became acceptable, socially acceptable to eat anything, anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. Um, business meetings, uh, walking down the street. I'm almost surprised we don't have some snacks here to get us through <laughs> yeah, right, this. The subways, buses, anywhere. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that was a real turning point. That also coincided with the start of the obesity epidemic. And I think what it led to is this form of eating called mindless eating, where you're hand to mouth, mm -hmm. not paying attention. It reminds me of the opposite of what my mom encouraged me when I was growing up. She said, Michael, chew your food, slow down. And there was science behind that because your brain takes some time to catch up with your chewing and so does your stomach. Um, and to send you those signals that, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting full here, you're getting full, slow down, there's a delayed reaction. And I think that from a consumer standpoint, I'm hoping this book will show people the way to that is, you know, easy things we can do to go back to mindful eating and paying a little bit more attention to our food because that will help empower us. If we want to have control over what we eat, I think we just do need to pay a little more attention. You have clearly not let the food giants off the hook or consumers or regulators, but let's not leave the video game manufacturers out of this too because as soon as the video games came out, people became couch potatoes and this phen whole phenomenon we're talking about today got worse as yeah. well, didn't it? No, there is that, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. What are you, you going to, as soon as you leave the studio, I wonder, where are you heading? 
Airport, right? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me what I'm going to eat. Well, that's, that was coming next. <laughs> you're going to go to the airport. You're going to wait an airport, hour for your flight. And what are you going to It may be grab? delayed uh, by weather. Yeah. I'll look around. Um, I'll probably wait until I get home. I mean, airports for me are actually pretty dangerous places. <laughs> it's really amazing. You can't go to a vending machine and get fresh apples or carrots. You know, it's really kind of stunning just how inaccessible, good, the better for you food is when you're on the road. Yep. And especially road warriors have to be really careful about what they eat. So I will tend to sort of put off my meal rather than deal with what's in front of me. Good for you, such <laughs> discipline. <laughs> well, He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Michael Moss. Salt, sugar, fat, how the food giants hooked us. It's really good of you to visit us these last couple of days here at TVO. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.